also, you know, pretty much throughout my entire life. Um, so I'll try to be brief here. Uh, like Christy mentioned, uh, I spent a little over six years with Techstars, uh, first as the global director of Startup Week, working on our community team, and then uh, joining the ecosystem development team. Uh, and in the role on the eco dev team, uh, I pretty much was a startup ecosystem coach. So I would go into different ecosystems that would hire tech stars and uh, meet with the key stakeholders of that ecosystem and help coach them through the process of creating the thriving ecosystem. Prior to that, uh, I mentioned I was a founder. Um, I did one of those crazy things where I was a, a co-founder uh, of a startup and owned a uh, was a minority partner in an advertising agency. Uh, so tried to do both simultaneously for two years. Not good. Uh, would not recommend that. And then um, even going back further in my mid mid twenties, I experienced a significant mental health crisis uh, that lasted about two years. Um, primarily because I didn't know how to ask for help. And that's why it went so long. But um, yeah, just really grateful to be here and talk about that and share and answer any questions. So hand it over to Laura. Yeah, yeah. likewise. I'm very thankful to be joining you all to talk about this very important topic. In fact, it is also a passion of mine. I completed my PhD in clinical psychology last year. And my focus is on the development of digital therapeutics for mental health. And during my process at P during my PhD, I also had a, a couple of existential crises that led me to realize that I wanted a career change. I wanted to go on a path that was very uncertain. And it took a lot of courage and a lot of effort on my end to do that. Um, and throughout the process, I learned how to cope with my own mental health difficulties, but also help other people cope with their own as a clinical psychologists either providing therapy or providing psychological assessments. So in everything that I do, I always use the experiences that I had clinically um, and I inform my develop the development of technologies uh, for mental health in that way as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Matt and Laura. Um, so my first question for y'all, um, so highly driven and successful people often suffer from mental health problems too. Um, at Techstars, we found that it's really important to name it and normalize it. So in your opinion, why are entrepreneurs a vulnerable population when it comes to mental health? Yeah, I, I guess I could start. So one of the, the things that I do know about driven people and people who are doing work that they're passionate about is that they feel a high sense of responsibility. So they have a lot of expectations about themselves. They also feel responsible to, to sort of fulfill this idea or, or for the people who are relying on them in their business. So it can be pretty isolating, I think, for a lot of entrepreneurs, um, especially if all the decisions that they have to make have such great implications for the people around them. So I think that that makes this specific population very vulnerable. And also, as I mentioned, they, they probably have very high expectations of themselves. And the issue with that is that usually when you meet those expectations, you tend to increase those expect expectations as time goes. And that's just the nature of business. So I can imagine people feeling like they're never good enough. Their business is never uh, where they want it to be because there's, so, there's always that benchmark that's shifting. Yeah, and I would just add uh, yes to everything Laura said. Um, and from from the uh, founders that I work with in my coaching practice, and and also in my own experience, um, it's entrepreneurs face a significant amount of stress, um, much more than. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to say well, it's more than the average person. I think we all. Uh, have a level of stress, but entrepreneurship, the, the stresses that come with it, oftentimes this isn't something that is known uh, when you start a business. Uh, you just jump into it because you think you have an amazing idea or you have an amazing team to build something. And then along the way, these things start to reveal themselves, uh, especially if you're, uh, you know, there's so many challenges and struggles that come with it in, the, you know, the early stages of entrepreneurship where you are, uh, you're strapped for cash. You're trying to get product market fit. Um, there's all these things that are happening. And then there's the next level of stress. So maybe you've proven, you've validated your, your business, um, but now you're raising capital. 
And so then, you know, ratchet up the, the stress there. So every step of the way, it's just like you continue to turn up the stress level. Uh, and a lot of times you're not prepared for that. You're not given the tools. Um, rarely are you given the tools or do you have a mentor who says, listen, before you start all of this, you have to focus on your mental health and have a good, uh, good practices in place because uh, this is going to get really hard. Um, you know, I think the statistic I heard was that one in five people, uh, just one in five regular people will have some sort of mental health uh, event in the course of their lifetime. Uh, it's three times higher for entrepreneurs. And I think it's just because of all of the stuff that comes with entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Matt. Um, so before we joined, Laura was telling us about her dissertation and how stressful that was. And Matt, I know your personal story. So can you each speak to some of the lessons you've learned on um, how you've had to prioritize your, your own mental health? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So um, as you, Matt, were mentioning, so graduate students are a particular population that is very vulnerable to mental health issues as well. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is because there's a lot uh, that, well, there's a lot of isolation and there's also a huge pressure uh, on getting sort of like all the requirements to get a PhD. And the dissertation is one of them. And it, while I was in my PhD program, I realized that the research area that I was focusing early on wasn't my passion. So I decided to sort of go against the recommendations of my program and look for something that was more uh, more akin to, to my personality and my goals, which was the development of te technologies for mental health. So a lot of that process was very difficult because I didn't have really a lot of mentorship. I didn't know what I was doing. I felt like an imposter talking to engineers and, and computer scientists about mental health. I had no idea what I was doing, uh, but the way that I cope with that but was by reflecting on everything that was going, I was going through in my life. So I was testing a lot of different topics. And finally, I was able to find something that was meaningful to me, uh, which I, and, and I completed my dissertation. And one thing that I learned with my dissertation is that it is okay to fail. So no matter how good or bad my dissertation was going to be, I was always going to feel like it wasn't good enough. Um, so I felt that throughout the process, I learned that it was okay to have self-compassion and to realize that during that time in my life, this was the best I could do. And I, and I learned to live with that and, and to embrace that journey um, of stress. And I also learned to focus on the process rather than the outcome. So when I first started my PhD program, I had no idea that I was going to be where I am at now. Um, this is a completely different path, different career, different outcome. Um, but what was important was that I process, I focused on the process of learning, learning as much as I could during my PhD, during those stressful moments, learning about myself, learning about the field. And that really led me to gain the, the, the skill sets and, and sort of support my own resilience during the process. <laughs> really good. Thank you. And Matt, what about you? Yeah, um, you know, Laura, you, you mentioning self-compassion, that's such a huge piece of this, um, realizing that you're worthy of your own self-compassion, mm -hmm. and then that leading to self-love, which is, you know, I, I, that's a question I like to ask a lot of my clients at the beginning stages of our relationship is, do you love yourself? And they look at me like I'm crazy, like that's narcissistic in some way, and it's the opposite. Uh, you, if, mm -hmm. you know, you have to learn to love yourself. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. And the, the other thing that I'll, I'll say for me is a big lesson that was learned was the mind-body connection and um, how to cultivate that. Because in my particular situation, my body was telling me everything was wrong. There is something desperately wrong happening here. Uh, but the way my brain works is I'm really good at tricking myself that mm -hmm. nothing's wrong and that uh, I can actually get through this, I can persevere. Um, so for two years, I was basically in the closet about my condition. Uh, there was, you know, this was 20 years ago. Uh, I think the, you know, the stigma is still here, but I really felt the stigma back then. Uh, I could lose my job, I could lose my marriage. 
Um, people will look at me funny. I may end up in a hospital forever. Um, all of those things were going through my mind. And yet my brain is screaming at me, get help. This feels awful. Um, and so, like I, I mentioned at the beginning, I ignored this for, for two years. Coming out of it was very humbling because I did end up in the hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. I checked myself in the day before my 27th birthday and ended up leaving the hospital four days later. Actually, when I checked myself in, I thought I was going to be there for the rest of my life. And I had to surrender to that. I needed help. I couldn't do this on my own anymore. And the only avenue left for me was hospitalization. But then I completely transformed just in that four days uh, because I was given the right medication. I could get my mind back into control. And then I really started to learn like, oh, my body was telling me all of these things. Um, so that was that's probably uh, the biggest lesson learned for me over these last 20 years is that mind body piece. That's great advice, Matt. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> So Matt, I've heard that, um, your story before, and I've heard that you mentioned how your struggles have actually shaped you in many positive ways and how that has impacted how you enjoy helping others found to get founders navigate their own challenges that inevitably come up. Um, so can you share a little bit about how you found your inner strength after you were hospitalized and in your darkest moments, how did you navigate that in the moment? And then what helped you build resilience and kind of get over that hump? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, I think in the moment when it was all happening, the only choice that I had was surrender. Um, there was nothing more that I could do because I was in that critical point of, is my life going to end? Uh, I was not suicidal, but I was, my brain was convinced that I was going to die. Um, I had a lot of irrational thoughts while I was going through my mental health crisis, one of which this just, I could not escape it. It's like, I describe it as if you, you know, those moments when you get a song stuck in your head, that's what happened to me, but with really terrible thoughts, they wouldn't go away. They were just always there. Um, so one of the big ones was you are going to die when you turn 27 and I couldn't shake it. Um, and the reason for that number 27 was because a lot of my idols uh, passed away when uh, they were 27. People like Kurt Cobain, Jimi Hendrix, um, told, and I knew it, was, it, it wasn't logical at all. Um, and I just fought it. I was like, you're not a rock star. You don't do drugs. Uh, you're not going to die when you're 27. And my brain would scream at me, yes, you are. And so that's why the day before my 27th birthday uh, was such a critical moment. Um, so in the moment, the biggest thing for me was to, to surrender. This is, you know, it was, it was very humbling uh, for me to have to look in the mirror and say, okay, you can't do this on your own anymore. You are done. And you have to put your life into the hands of experts at this moment. Um, so that was, that happened, you know, that was that weekend. Uh, and then coming out of the hospital, it was a rebuilding process before hospitalization. Uh, the other thing that I didn't realize was a voice that arose for me a lot was the voice of ego telling me how great I was. Um, you deserve awards. You're better than other people. You're smarter than other people. And I didn't really believe it, but that voice just kept coming up. And it wasn't until after uh, I, you know, it took many years, actually three years of therapy, meditation, mindfulness practices to realize that's a voice of ego and I don't have to listen to it. Um, so I was completely transformed in that moment. Um, the ego was dissolved. I surrendered. Uh, and then I could, I saw that you could um, in the act of surrender survive. Uh, and then come out of it. As long as you commit to the practices, uh, I mentioned mindfulness, that was a key for me, has been a key for me for, for the last 20 years. Meditation and uh, other practices to be present, to understand that the only moment that really exists is this moment right now. And we can spend all of our time worrying about the future or being sad about the past. Um, so that's how I, I deal with everything now exercise, eating well. I think we'll probably get into that a little bit later, but I've been long-winded. 
I love that. Um, so Laura, when you and I connected, you talked to me about how you enjoy thinking like a scientist um, in your life. Uh, what do you mean by that? And then just kind of a follow-up question or um, what are some ta tactical tips or advice um, that you have for um, people as we're shifting out of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. And thank you so much, Matt, for, for sharing your story. Uh, that's very meaningful and I can totally relate to the fear of death. In fact, um, I use my scientific thinking to realize that I also was struggling with fear of death. So um, for me, science is about the discovery, the questioning of something that's going on. You notice a pattern, you question it, and you try to research and, and try to make predictions and theories about what's leading up to this experience. And then you test those predictions, either in experiments or by observing uh, data over time. And I really enjoy that. And I enjoyed applying that to my clients that apply, like while I was doing therapy and also applying it to my own life. And during the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, just reinforcing the idea of mind-body connection, I noticed that I was having a lot of back pain. Uh, I noticed I was having a lot of rashes in my face and I knew something was off. A lot of things were happening at the same time. I was trying to finish my dissertation. My grandma had been diagnosed with cancer. I was trying to survive coronavirus and wanted my family to survive the virus. And I was starting a new job. So a lot of changes were happening and I sort of went on to autopilot mode or survival mode. And I think a lot of us, when we're under stress, we go in, onto that mode that if we need to work 10 hours a day, we're gonna work 10 hours a day. And if our, we're not gonna exercise, we're not gonna eat healthy. And that sort of takes a second priority because we don't, we haven't learned to take care of ourselves. And I was there at that time. And when my body started sort of bringing up the signals, the pain, I realized I needed to do something about it, but I didn't know where to start. So there were so many issues that I had, it was impossible to, to figure out what was happening underneath all of these sort of symptoms. And um, what I started doing was checking in so I created a Google form for myself. So I created an, my own study and I checked in with myself every day for three minutes. And I just rated my emotions and added some comments about what the day was like. Just rating my emotions. Didn't really think more about it because I didn't have time. I didn't think I had time to self-reflect. So I was just rating the emotions that I was feeling throughout the day. And once a month or every two weeks, I would sit down for about 30 minutes and look at my data. And the insights I got from that data were very meaningful. In fact, I realized that a lot of my stress at work related to my dissertation was also rooted in this, rooted in this fear of death, of what the purpose of life is and what, what are we doing this if it could just go away in one second. And um, as a psychologist, I know that when you have fears, the last thing you want to do is avoid. <laughs> so I did not avoid. And I did an experiment where I sort of chose to every day write a poem about death or some death topic related. I know it sounds really dark, um, but it really helped me connect to my thoughts about death and also my thoughts about life and why was life worth living. And one thing that I realized in this process was that that one, I was able to, to sort of process my fear while doing something creative like poetry um, and two, I realized that what really helped me cope with my, my fear of death was realizing that there were a lot of things about being alive that I loved and that there wouldn't be fear, there wouldn't be that love without that fear of losing it. Um, and that's sort of like you were saying, Matt, it's sort of a surrendering that you are going to experience some of these emotions and you just have to adapt in the circumstances and make the most out of what you have. But I wouldn't have gotten that, to that had I not been tracking my data, uh, looking at it more in, from a more introspective way, um, and yeah, and experimenting with poetry. And then you could see, like in my data, you could see my mood really improved and my my stress at work improved because I wasn't just so focused on it. I had more things uh, that were sort of supporting my mental health at the time, um, and I sort of use that all the time. If I if I see that I'm I'm going off balance or I'm noticing more pain, so I'm not exercising, I'm escaping perhaps. One of the things that I do is escaping. So I watch a lot of TV or I, I, I like dancing. So I go hours dancing, I go out hours dancing 
And I know that something is off and that I need to check in with myself. And science just gives me a framework to do it. So I'm more objective about it. I love that. That's, that's really helpful for me. Um, Matt, do you have any other tactical tips or things that you do um, when you're starting to feel anxious or stressed? Yeah. Yeah. And, and Laura, when, when you were talking about the poetry, um, I put it in the chat there. I just met a woman from Seattle who is a, uh, an author um, and she started a thing called Emberville, which is invites people to write and face their fears. Um, so if anybody's interested, it's in the chat, check that out. Uh, for me personally, it is, uh, it's very similar to what Laura was talking about, uh, check-ins. Um, and just having, you know, it's part of presence building and saying, how am I feeling right now? And being really honest about it. Um, oftentimes I will, uh, I, I won't, I won't have that immediate presence. I'll be kind of, uh, you know, in my head and then I'll notice, Ooh, like it happened this morning. I was feeling a lot of anxiety. Uh, and I didn't know why it was just out of the blue. And instead of trying to cover it up and run away from it, instead, I just sat there and go, okay, why are these, why are these feelings arising for me? And I just took a few deep breaths and felt, felt through it. And I said, you know, it's probably just cause I'm tired. Um, I've been, I've been getting into cycling because my exercise during pandemic, during the pandemic went way down. I'd go to the gym two or three times a week all of that stopped. And so I picked up a new, I was like, okay, I'm going to take on cycling. I've rode 55 miles in the last two days. That's too much. I'm obsessive compulsive. And so I'll get obsessed about things. And I went I, and I said, oh, okay, this makes perfect sense. Anxiety is right, rising for me. I'm not afraid of anything today. Um, it's because I'm overly tired. And what my body is telling me is you need to rest. So I'm not going to ride the next two days. Plus it's going to be 103. I think the heat index is going to be 108. Uh, so not a good time to be outside anyway. Um, but those check-ins can, can really, really help. And so, um, you know, what I do with my clients, oftentimes when we start off the coaching relationship, I'll say, I just want you to check in with yourself five times a day. And so anybody on this call, um, this is something that you can put into immediate practice. And uh, just ask yourself how you're feeling. Uh, whatever comes up, don't try to judge it. Just it'll arise for you. And then ask yourself, where am I feeling this in my body? Because then you start to make that connection because oftentimes the body sensation will come up before you recognize it in your head. And then whatever happens with it, um, just name it. Just say, okay, I'm feeling tired today. What, what do I need? And oftentimes the, you'll be able to answer your question. I need to rest or I need to not escape. I need to take this on. Uh, so those are, those are some real easy techniques you can start to put into place right now. Yeah. And I would like to add to that, that one of the things that I've found very helpful was having someone to talk to about these things. So one, one thing that I did during my tracking, I was doing it with a friend and we did it together. So having someone who was accountable who was like keeping me accountable, basically, really motivated me to do those check-ins. So at first, it's really hard to do things for yourself, especially if you're not used to taking care of yourself. Um, so having someone that can provide you with some of, that, some of that external motivation is very helpful. And also just discussing the patterns that you're noticing. So having the role of a coach or the role of the therapist in a lot of circumstances, it's giving you another perspective that perhaps you haven't really thought of. So I think having someone, whether it's a close friend, a family member, a significant other, that you can discuss these things with, uh, and they can give you a, a different perspective, that that's very useful. And another tip, I'm very obsessive about tracking. So that's why I do like my data tracking and my forms. Um, but I also do a lot of passive tracking. So I own a Fitbit, I track my sleep, I track my, my menstrual cycles, I try to track what I eat, but not as effective, um, but it really helps me to get a bigger picture of what's going on in my life. Um, even my coffee. So like I, I realized while tracking that I was drinking way too much coffee. So I, I started changing and experimenting and realized that, that in fact, I don't want to drink as much coffee because I have more energy throughout the day if I don't. So all, all these things only happen when you're really 
mindful about those check-ins. And if you are not as sort of like, a, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not able to really understand what's going on, then tracking and having that, that external data can help you a lot. Yeah, that both of those are really great tips for me. I feel like even, and I'm not even an entrepreneur, but I wake up and I think about all the things that I need to do today and just keep plowing forward. So slowing down, looking inward, um, to the tracking it works very well with my data brain. So that's something I will definitely take away. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. So let's shift gears for a minute. So Laura, you um, mentioned imposter syndrome. Um, I feel like I definitely need a front row seat for this um, in my head. I'm like, I'm a fraud. I don't deserve this and all of that. Um, and I was listening to an Adam Grant podcast this week, and he said that um, upwards of 60% of people actually have imposter syndrome. So um, how can we turn that into a strength or what are some tips um, and tactics and advice around? Around feeling like an imposter. Yeah. Um, so I have, yeah, I've experienced a lot of imposter syndrome in my life. So uh, first of all, I moved to the States when I was a, a teenager. I was born and raised in Colombia. So I had to learn English as a second language. I sort of had to prove myself to an extent uh, in my mind. So I, I still struggle with imposter syndrome. And one thing that's very interesting uh, and that helped me is learning about the Dunning-Kruger effect or the bias. So if you're not familiar with this, is this cognitive bias where in people who have low skill sets in a specific um, topic or a specific field, they feel very confident. So they sort of overcompensate by, by estimating their confidence, their, their abilities as being very high. But when you are very skilled at something, the opposite happens. So when you're at skill at something, you underestimate your abilities. And I feel like imposter syndrome is for those people who tend to underestimate their abilities a lot more. And one thing that I have to say is that you probably have imposter syndrome because you know a lot and you know the things that you don't know. You're more aware of the things that you don't know that you don't know. And that gets into sort of like a more accurate perception of, of what you know. And it's great because if you turn that into a growth mentality, a learning mentality, knowing that you don't know, it's actually an opportunity to learn, um, to learn more and, and focus on, on growing your skill sets. And the more I learn, the more confident I feel I, that I can tell others when I don't know, because there's many things that I don't know. So that really helped me. Um, and the other thing that, that helped me in grad school a lot was one, one thing that I really struggle with in general is writing. Uh, it takes me like three, uh, like three times as much as a regular person to write something. And I remember I really was struggling with my dissertation, uh, feeling very incompetent and unable to express myself. And what I started doing was taking dance classes. So I hadn't done professional dance, dancing. I, I hadn't really had dance classes growing up. I just knew how to dance because that's what we do in Colombia, but it's not... <laughs> It's not necessarily as, as structured. And one, one thing that that helped me with was developing self-compassion because in dance, I came back to being a child, the, the child mentality that it's okay to not know because I didn't grow up dancing these type of, 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 dance, of dance techniques. I didn't know how to do that. And it was okay to not know. And I think that challenging myself in a completely unrelated field Having a community that I could that I could struggle with was really helpful. I think in order for me to translate that self compassion into my own work as a psychologist, that's why I finished my dissertation. <laughs> that's why I'm where, where where I'm at, and yeah, and I continue dancing, and it's something. It's like learning a new language. You never you never stop learning. So I I I learned to see everything like that. I love that. Thank you so much, Laura. So Matt, what about you? What are your thoughts on imposter syndrome? And I'm curious in your interactions with founders, have you noticed any self-esteem changes throughout the pandemic? Yeah, um, good questions. So for me personally, imposter syndrome uh, sh showed up the vast majority of my life. It wasn't until I was probably 42 or 43. So just in the last three or four years, uh, that I really started to lean into that self-compassion. I finally cultivated enough of it to what I, um, what I and other people call enoughness. 
I have enough. Uh, I am worthy of being in whatever room um, this, this uh, you know, body enters into. And that can be really hard, especially when there's, uh, you know, famous people or really, really rich people. Uh, when I came to Techstars, it was like my body was screaming imposter syndrome. Um, I, I remember, I think this was 2008, uh, watching videos of uh, David Cohen taking the, I, I don't know if it was the first or second uh, cohort through the accelerator and watching every episode and going, oh, I would love to work for someplace like Techstars, but they would never hire me. I don't have, you know, I'm, I'm not an MBA. I, I'm not from Stanford. These are probably all Harvard business school people. And, you know, fast forward several years, I was part of Up Global and uh, we were acquired by Techstars. And so all of a sudden I end up in this space that in my mind, I didn't think I belonged anyway, and now I'm expected to perform. And so all these alarm bells went off and through, and over the course of a few years, I came to realize that I, I do belong in those rooms. And, and to Laura's point, I have a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. I am a work in progress. So if I approach every day uh, as if I, you know, good, I'm in a room filled with smart people, I'll be able to learn something today. And I also, uh, uh, the other thing that I'm, I'm thinking about this just popped into my head is one of the things I, one of my favorite words is audacity. Uh, just being audacious and saying to yourself, why not me? Why can't I be the one that goes for that job? Or why can't I be this person that builds the business, right? And just having the audacity to move forward, it doesn't mean that you're gonna do it without fear and that you're going to have this huge ego or be narcissistic. It's just be a work in progress, move forward, um, learn new things every single day. Uh, but the thing is, is you're not going to overcome imposter syndrome overnight. Uh, it's going to take a lot of practice, a commitment to looking in the mirror uh, and, and being in practicing self-compassion. Uh, and, and then eventually it'll start to, to fade away and then it'll pop up. You may think, no, I'm, I don't have imposter syndrome. And then three years later, boom, it hits you right in the face <laughs> okay. and you have to go, okay, it showed up again. It doesn't mean all the work is thrown out the window. It just means, okay, got to come back to my practices. Um, and what was your second question, Christy? I was just curious um, for both of you in your interactions with founders and colleagues, mm. um, have you noticed any self-esteem changes throughout the pandemic at all? Yeah, I'll answer that quickly and then uh, give it over to you, Laura. Um, I think I've seen it with everyone. I've seen vast majority of people are really, really struggling right now. Um, I haven't, I wouldn't say it's, it's like more than normal for founders. I think it's at normal levels. Um, but yeah, uh, we just work through it. We, you know, like everything I just said, that's what we do, uh, with the founders I work with. And it, as things are opening up, you're, you're seeing some of that pandemic fatigue start to lift and moods are starting to be raised, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of long-term effects from what we've all experienced. And so that we, we have to keep our radars up, uh, for what may emerge. Yeah, indeed. Um, one thing I wanted to add, Matt, uh, to the self-compassion piece, um, something that really helped me gain compassion for myself was learning how to be compassionate for others. And I feel like it's a cycle. The more you're compassionate for others, especially as a therapist, I had to be compassionate with my clients. I had to be sort of providing with a very safe space and accepting space and learning how to do that with my, with my clients really <laughs> sort of solidified me doing that for myself. Um, and I feel like it was a process where the more I was able to do it for them, the more I was able to do it for myself and vice versa. So if you find that it's very hard for you to have self-compassion, then try to talk to other people about their problems and learn to, to value their experience and help them in their journey. And I'm pretty sure that's gonna help you. Um, another really good fast tip, doing things for yourself, even if it's just a little thing, like drinking a glass of water in the morning. Just that one thing, I think you start by developing habits that sort of signify to your body that you're taking care of, of 
of itself, that over time can build up your ability to have self-compassion. Uh, regarding the pandemic and self-esteem, yes, I've noticed it myself with my own personal experiences and the people that I talk to, many of my clients, um, the isolation, I think really triggers a lot of self-esteem problems. Uh, I think that many of us sort of rely on the community and the people are around us to feel worthy. Uh, if we're they sort of are like our mirrors, they reflect how we're doing. And if we don't have a community nearby, uh, then it's very difficult to, to sort of see ourselves through the lenses of someone else. And we're left with how we, we sometimes look at ourselves. And for me, it's not like it is, it is not easy for me to look at myself in a good light. I have to really work on, work on that. So I think um, I can certainly see how the social distancing and the isolation may contribute to problems with self-esteem. Um, and one thing that I would certainly do is, is try to talk about it with someone else, with a friend, uh, develop a community, coaches, um, people who can help you sort of think about different ways to approach your own per perceptions of yourself. And I'm sure as the pandemic opens, um, it'll be okay. But I think something to realize is that during this time, this social distancing time, it's also an opportunity to reflect on how we truly feel about ourselves. So without the distractions of other people around, without the distraction of a commute or going out, then I'm still struggling with lack of self-compassion or imposter syndrome or low self-esteem. Then this is an opportunity to really sort of get to the root of the, pro the problem with someone else, uh, with the help of someone else. That's really great. Thank you, Laura. So let's shift and talk a little bit about burnout. Um, it's a global concern. Um, I recently read that seven out of 10 knowledge workers um, felt burnt out and maybe the number is even higher right now. Um, I know it hurts many entrepreneurs and startups as well. Um, so how do you identify um, when you're getting burned out? What are some of the symptoms and signals um, to look out for? Yeah, I can start. So I, for me, like Matt was saying, it's my body. <laughs> so I, I first noticed that things are off when I feel pain, uh, especially lower back and knee pain. And that just means that I've been sitting down for too long in a, in a very tense position. Um, and also I overeat, I watch a lot of TV. And then it, usually it's just stress about what I'm doing, not feeling like I know what I'm doing, that I don't, I don't know what the purpose of what I'm doing is or where I'm going. So I start sort of losing sight of where my values are. Um, and those are the signals for me that I'm burning out, that I'm not taking care of myself. Um, and something that I usually help people with whenever they're experiencing burnout, but I also use myself is I use a lot of metaphors. And one of the metaphors I use for burnout is that of like pain. So when you have pain in your body, it's a, like a signal it tells you, hey, there's something that you need to attend. There's something that you need to change in order to gain balance again or healing. Um, and you sort of go in that process. In the same way, when you're driving, if there's a stop sign on the road, the purpose of that stop sign is to get you to go from autopilot into more of a mindful process so you can realize what's, what's ahead of you and what's a danger and what's not and where you want to go. Sort of choose where you want to go. And I feel like burnout, it's that, it's just the moment where our body and our mind, uh, they're off balance and you have an opportunity to connect with yourself and, and think about what you're doing and, and how, how the time that you're spending at work or you're spending outside of work, it's connecting with your values and what you find it's important. Um, so that's, that's what, I've, that I've, what I've learned about burnout myself. Uh, every time I burned out, I came out even stronger because now I knew what I didn't want to do in the long term, <laughs> right? So I knew how to approach my work and life differently. That's great. Matt, what are your thoughts on burnout? Yeah, yeah. for me, burnout shows, shows up as fatigue. Um, and the way that I uh, came to realize that, uh, you know, I've had multiple experiences with burnout. Uh, the biggest being, uh, like I mentioned earlier, a couple, well, back when I was in my early 30s trying to run a startup and a uh, agency at the same time, um, and just chronically tired. 
And I didn't know that was what's going on. And I made the big mistake of, of buying into hustle culture. Uh, it was really strong then. There were a lot of voices coming out in 2008, 2009 uh, about you got to crush it. And if you're tired, um, so what? You, you want this really bad. So you're going to work really, really hard. Uh, and I, I could do that for about two years. And then I just hit a point where I couldn't do anything. Uh, I had to get, you know, I, I said to uh, uh, my co-founder, I said, well, either, you know, I'm going to make a choice between one of these two things. Do you want me to come on full time with your thing? He's like, well, we can't pay you yet. It was all equity. And I was like, okay, I'm done. Uh, but then what that ended up doing is it cost me my relationship with my, my business partner at the agency because I was putting so much work into this other startup. I, you know, I put in eight to, to nine hours, sometimes 10 hours into the agency during the day. And then I was staying up till midnight or 2 a.m. Uh, putting effort into the startup because I thought that's what it took. Uh, and then I ended up wrecking myself. I didn't have enough energy at the end to do anything. I couldn't give it to either. Uh, so I ended up leaving both. Um, so you have to watch. If you've had moments of burnout before, watch for those signals. You, you should know. Um, and and if, you, if you haven't gone through burnout yet, but you're suspecting it, keep track of the things that you're feeling. Oh, I'm feeling tired all the time. Or like Laura said, there's pain that's showing up in my body and I don't know why. Um, it's, it's all, it's, it is important to, to track all of that. Um, but a long winded answer to say, you're going to know best when you're hitting burnout, um, watch for those signals and be, be brave enough to admit I am burned out and it's okay to ask for help. That's great advice, Matt. I'd love to open it up to see if anyone has any thoughts or questions. You can feel free to put it in the chat. Um, if you wanna raise your hand in the reactions, you can raise your hand um, in the reactions. And maybe while we're waiting and while people are thinking, Laura, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, applied VR. I don't know a lot about applied VR and I would love to hear about your work there. Yeah, it's right, me. So, um... We, we talk a lot about pain today and pain in our bodies. Well, pain is very complex. So you can treat pain physiologically with medications and surgeries, but there are also behavioral treatments for pain. And these behavioral treatments focus, so much, focus a lot on realizing the, the, the things that trigger your pain, the stressors that trigger your pain, like burnout, imposter syndrome, all these things. And part of the treatment is helping people identify those and learn different coping skills. Um, and one thing that applied VR noticed was the, the need for behavioral medicine or behavioral treatments for chronic pain to be accessible for everyone. Um, and they're using virtual reality as a way to bring these behavioral treatments into people's homes. So people who, because of many reasons, are unable to receive or access behavioral treatments that they're able to understand a little bit more about their pain and uh, how to cope with it from the comfort in their, of their homes and using a very immersive and engaging technology. So that's what the company does. And my role in the company is uh, helping them with the content development of, the product, of our product, of the treatment. So making sure that it's evidence-based based on, on, based on therapies that are, that are um, sort of common for chronic pain. And also making sure that the, the product is tested for efficacy. So whether it works or not for individuals and whether it's safe. So my role is in the research and in design part of the, of the company. And I'm now starting to look more into the future and developing more products. That's great, super fascinating stuff. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. We have a couple of questions that came in. Um, so Scott asked, what is a solo founder supposed to do about burnout and hustling? So solo founders can't pass the load off to the next person to take a break. Um, the business itself can't take a break. So what are your tips for solo founders? Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. It is really, really hard if you're a solo founder. Uh, I won't lie. And you have to kind of come to a realization that you only have so much that you can give. And, um, you know, one of the things I learned from Brad Feld was this concept of there is no work-life balance, but there is harmony. And so you have to decide for yourself, what does harmony look like? Now, obviously, as a founder, you're going to have to put a lot of time and effort into building your business. Um, but 
it also means that you have to give yourself permission to rest. What does rest look like for you? How do you fit that into your day? Um, I know that the pressure to like to succeed and get this business off the ground is extremely high. Um, but the thing that I talk to a lot of the founders I work with about is if you can't, if, if you deplete yourself, you will have nothing to give your business. And that's not a good position to be in. So you have to take care of yourself first before you take care of your business and whatever that looks like for you. But it is kind of a prescription and you have to be the person that comes up with that prescription. So maybe it's exercise in the morning, um, taking a good hard look at what your diet is. Are you eating well? Um, what kind of sleep are you getting? Uh, you know, Laura probably can speak to this more than, than I can, but one of the first questions, I've been through therapy uh, several times, I'm a huge advocate of therapy, but they'll say, how are you sleeping? And I used to think, well, what does that matter? Now it's like so incredibly important. How am I sleeping? Oh, I'm not sleeping well. Every, all those little things are, will continue to deplete you. Um, so if you really want this business to, to succeed, you first have to put the look in the mirror and say, I, you know, I have to put practices into place so that I as a human being succeed. And there's times when I have to say, no, you can't say yes to everything. So what are those priorities? List them out. What are the most critical things to do that week? You can't do 90 items in a week. You're, you're lying to yourself. But what are the most critical things? Get those done, but then also build in the time for rest to eat well and to exercise. That's really great advice. Um, I know that our accelerators um, advise our startups to create a don't do list. So that feels like that could be relevant here. And as you're talking, I'm a runner. And so my brain jumps to, okay, yeah, I can't sprint all the time. You've got to, you got to take rest days and you're actually going to be faster in the long run when you do take those, those rests. It's just hard to conceptualize when you're in the moment <laughs> for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We look through some questions. Um, so do you have any tips for young entrepreneurs on taking steps now to prevent burnout um, or overwhelming struggles with mental health? Yeah, I think the biggest the biggest tip I can give you is <laughs> doing one thing for yourself, for your mental health. So I know we've talked about multiple things. Sleep, sleep is super important. Uh, healthy eating, exercising, tracking your menstrual cycle if you're a female. Um, so making sure that you're aware of all these things, but there's there's only so much you can do and you can start with. So the, the, the tip, the main tip is if you spend five minutes just reflecting and doing something for yourself. Just go build that momentum. Just get those five minutes. If you need to talk to someone in order to get those five minutes, it's totally worth it. Worth it. This is an investment in your future, in your body, in your quality of life. Uh, so it's worth it to think about it now and start from, from very little and then grow from there. As you develop a good habit of checking in with yourself or reflecting or doing something for yourself, I'm telling you it's a hundred times easier to develop the second habit and then sort of get the ball rolling. Great advice. I know we're just about at time if the hour flies by quick. Um, thank you both to Laura and Matt. My final question for you is what final words of advice do you have for those that are either struggling or trying to find their personal inner strength or they're burned out? What, what advice would you wanna leave them with? Yeah, um, I love that question. I, I would say that you are worthy and deserving of help. Don't think you're not. If you're struggling, don't do what I did and wait two years to get help. If there's even an inkling that something's going on, um, reach out to somebody, uh, whether it's a friend or if you think there's something that needs to further investigation, um, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of therapy. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you, you deserve that time to spend on yourself talking about what's going on uh, in a safe place where there's no judgment. Um, and my hope is the more that we all collectively talk about this, there will be less and less stigma around it. 
You know, if you have something that maybe, you, you know, an internal organ is, is malfunctioning uh, and you said, yeah, something's going on. I need to see a doctor. Everyone's like, oh, I hope everything's okay. We need to get to that point with mental health. Um, so you, uh, my parting word is you're deserving of, uh, you're deserving of health. Uh, you're deserving, um, of spending the time you need to. And I would just leave this little, little piece of advice, cultivate a mindfulness practice, whatever that looks like for you. Five minutes a day of meditation, maybe join a yoga class, maybe just go out and walk and be present. Um, it can really be transformational. Yeah, thank you, man. Uh, yeah, I would just add to that the importance of focusing on the process rather than an outcome. So yes, you may feel burned out right now, and yes, you may not be where you want to be, but if you focus on the process, on the process of growing, on learning, of becoming better and learning how to, uh, how to adapt better, then things will just feel a lot easier and you'll be able to take steps towards improving your life now and also in the future. And then another another tip is becoming your own personal scientist. <laughs> so try to try to really think about about your life and, and concretize your life because a lot of this, a lot of times it's really hard to put things into practice. But sort of using science or data or or talking to someone is an opportunity to re really question and reflect and experiment. At the end of the day, mindfulness may not work for me. Meditation, breathing meditations only work for me to an extent, I need to do more things. So you need to figure out what works for you. And you can only do that by reflecting and being your personal scientist. And the last thing is there is a Latin phrase that I really love. It's, it says amor fati, and it's the love of faith. So loving your destiny, loving your life, loving the things that happen in your life. And I think that, that as I chat, like I struggle with my own challenges, I learned to understand that everyone has a unique journey and I cannot compare my life or I cannot compare myself to other people because my journey is different. The things that happen to me are different and the things that matter to me are different and they're only specific to me. And I need to just learn to embrace that, embrace that even if I do have burnout right now, even if I do struggle right now, that, that just means it's an opportunity to create and shape my own narrative, my own journey that eventually it's, you're going to, you're going to love it because you're designing it. Wow. Thank you, Matt and Laura. I'm so glad I have that on recording. I feel like I need to watch that before I start each day. Um, again, both so grateful for both of your insights and for spending time with us today. For everyone attending, I will share out this recording and also Matt's and Laura's LinkedIn um, profiles as well, if you would like to continue on the conversation with them. Um, remember, remember, we are all in this thing together. So um, if you need help, don't be afraid to ask um, any of us along the way. So thank you all. I hope you all have a great day, afternoon, evening, wherever it is in your part of the world. And we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Christy. Please reach out. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, Christy. You guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.